Well, hey, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, my name is Chris. Uh, if you've never seen me before, um, I'm a marketing manager at Planetar. And I can see your names. Yeah, I recognize a few of you. Not everybody, some new people. So I've done lots of master classes. I was a real estate photographer for a few years, and I worked um, with the iGuide uh, camera system as well. Um, I've shot, you know, thousands of iGuides, and I've used the camera in lots of different weird situations. So I do webinars about all sorts of things like how to shoot large spaces and how to shoot quickly. And you can find them all, uh, or most of them anyway, I mean, not all of them, on goiguide.com in the um, resources section um, or the media section. I forget where it is. Anyway, it's on the menu bar. All the webinars are there um, that we've you know um, recorded. And uh, there's lots of good content. So if you missed this one, We'll probably put it up there. Or if you just stop listening to me, you know, about halfway through and kind of have a bit of a snooze, that's okay too. I'm all right with that. I won't be offended. Also, I won't know. So, you know, you do you. Uh, okay, cool. Lots of people showing up. Great. Um, this webinar is going to be about Stitch. So Stitch is the post-processing software that is used to... Um, <laughs> that is used to, that's a, that's an awesome comment. Yes. All caps. It's in the chat. That's amazing. Touch enthusiasm. I love it. That uh, distracted me. I don't even know what I'm saying. Yeah. So this, this masterclass is all about stitch Stitch is a software that's used to process the data from the iGUIDE camera before you send it in. And um, I'm going to talk for maybe like 30 minutes or so. I'm going to show you stuff. I'm going to show you some tricks. Um, uh, we're going to talk about like what Stitch is for and why it's so great. And then you can just ask all the questions you want about anything you want. I don't care. If you want to ask questions about stuff other than Stitch, that's cool too. I won't mind. Um, the uh, one thing I would like to ask you is if you could, please, if you could go to our YouTube channel and um, subscribe to the iGUIDE YouTube channel, I would really greatly appreciate that. Um, we're trying to get up um, to a certain number of subscribers. I forget what it is off the top of my head, but if you can go there and subscribe, that would be amazing. Thank you. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, just talk about Stitch and what it is and what it's for. So um, fun fact, Stitch is called Stitch because with um, the IMS5 camera and then its predecessor, the IMS4 camera, Stitch did the job of stitching the images together. That's why it was called Stitch. That's why it's called Stitch. Um, so those images with the previous generation camera system, I'm gonna guess, I'm just guessing that a lot of you have Planix if you're here, um, but some of you may have IMS5, so you can always go look, but um, IMS5 used three fisheye images that were then stitched together by the software um, to create the, you know, the full 360 that you see when you, you, you know, look at an eye guide or when you're looking in stitch as well. Um, so with Planix, that's done on the camera. So stitch isn't stitching anything, but it's still called stitch because it's a good name, I guess. Um, the, uh, the process of using stitch is very, very simple and, but it gets a bad rap because it feels to some people like they're doing a lot of extra work, um, and it really mimics a workflow, not mimics, it's very similar to a workflow that you would have as a, a, you know, a real estate photographer, a photographer in general. And that workflow is, you know, take your device, shoot with it, capture data, and then load that data into some software on a computer and edit it. So if you do video, you know exactly what I'm talking about. There's no, there's no like automatic cloud process that like sends it anywhere. You have to create something with it. So Stitch is similar to that. It's very much like Photoshop, Adobe Photoshop or Adobe Lightroom or Adobe Premiere, all the Adobe products. Um, it's it's post-processing software that helps you create something from the data that you've captured before you send it to someone else. Um, the difference with Stitch is that it looks like it's gonna be that kind of workflow if you're already familiar with that. And that's the bad rap, but it's not, it's not like that. It's so easy. You can use stitch and edit properties in like five minutes. It can be so fast. The only thing you're like required, the only two things you're required to do in stitch, you absolutely have to do are load the data into stitch. <laughs> so that doesn't, you don't do anything. You just open it. I'll show you that in a second. 
and then um, you have to configure the grade levels in Stitch for each floor because there's no way for the drafting team uh, to know um, what level uh, of the property you know um, each level is at. So just because it says basement doesn't mean it's necessarily below grade. It's not very common here in Canada, but occasionally you'll have um, slab on grade. So it's a, it's a basement, but it's not below the earth. It's just sitting on the earth. Um, uh, I can see a comment about HDR. Yeah, we'll get into that in a second. So, um, or we'll do that after. We'll, I'll talk about Stitch first, because there's a part, I'll show you how to edit the JPEGs in uh, Stitch if you haven't figured it out yet. Uh, as in bring them into Photoshop. I don't have it on this computer, but that's okay. I can show you the, the steps to get there. So uh, just to round this all out, Stitch is software that prepares the data before you send it to the drafts people. And the reason it's awesome is that it allows you to configure the tour before you send it to the drafters. And that's fantastic because um, a lot of the things you can do in Stitch, uh, you can do online. You can do them on our iGuide portal. But if you do them in Stitch, you don't have to do that. You don't have to go online and configure everything. So the most common things you would configure are like room labels. So if you've got specific room labels that you want to have, well, um, you have to communicate to that to the dress people. They wouldn't know, right? They're going to guess. They're going to label all the rooms for you, but they might not know that this back room is an exercise room. It might look like a bedroom to them, but your client might say, no, that is an exercise room. You have to label it that way. So Stitch can allow you to do that before you send it to them. Um, and the reason that you would want to make those changes before you send it to them is that you can have them or you can have the whole system configured so that the eye guide will get sent directly to your client um, uh, when it's finished. So what most, if not all of you have probably noticed is that when you submit data for an eye guide, what happens is that you're gonna get a report back saying that it's ready, you know? So that report um, can be sent to whoever you want. So it can be sent to yourself or it can be sent directly to the person who bought it from you. So that can be sent directly to the agent and that's killer feature. So if you are doing a lot of shoots and you're out and you're shooting um, several houses a day, for example, and um, you know you shoot a bunch of properties on a Tuesday and you submit them for drafting, and then you go out on a Wednesday and you're shooting, those properties can be sent directly to your agent just on their own. You don't have to manually do it. You know, it gets sent to your inbox and then you forward it over. No, nope, it'll just get sent. So that means that, that your client will get them sooner. Um, there are some problems with that in that if you haven't finished adding video or still images to the eye guide yet, um, they wouldn't get them in addition to that. But that's a whole other, that's a whole other topic. We can talk about that later. We're, we're here to talk about Stitch. So let's talk about Stitch. Um, I'm going to load Stitch up right now. So if you don't know, Stitch can be downloaded from uh, the uh, website, goeyeguide.com forward slash downloads. Yeah, I'll even load it up and I'll show you. Let me share my screen. Give me one second here. Yeah, that's what we want. Okie dokie. Did I spell it right? Oh, I believe I did. Good stuff. This is cozy. I'm going to do all my webinars from a couch from now on. Okay, so goiguy.com forward slash downloads. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff here. I won't go through it, but you can see Planix, IMS5, some firmware manuals, but Stitch right here for PC and for Mac. Um, Stitch is not available for iPad or for a phone. It is a like desktop computer application only. Now I'm going to switch uh, windows and I'm going to share this one. So I'm just opening Stitch now. Uh, there we go. Okay. I hope you guys can see that. Let me know in the chat if you can see Stitch. It should be a big gray field of basically nothing. Unfortunately, the scaling's a little weird because I'm I'm currently doing this masterclass from a 55 inch television. So the icons are gonna be really tiny. It's like, it's 4K, it's like 3840 by 2160. So the icons are gonna be really, really tiny up in the top corner. So it shouldn't be like that for you if you're using a monitor that's got uh, better UI scaling. Uh, this was never designed for this. This TV and computer setup was designed to watch Godzilla movies. So we're just doing what we can here. Okay, so I hope you guys can see what I'm doing. I'm just going to load up um, some data that I happen to have. 
Uh, no dragon. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so it's loading. So when you load data into Stitch, what it does is it um, it does a little bit of work for you. So it depends on the camera system if you have that you have. If you have um, IMS five, it's actually going to do all the stitching automatically for all of your your panels just one by one, and then it's going to um, you know display them all to you. Uh, if you're loading up um, Planix data, it's going to do well. It's the same thing. It loads all the 360s in, but what it does is it along with IMS five applies auto adjustments, uh, and there is uh, a little bit of auto equalization that goes on. So. In IMS5, what happens is you have three separate images and sometimes they differ in exposure and they differ in um, color temperature. So Stitch does its best to kind of even them out, um, which is very cool because sometimes you'll be standing in a room and the light is changing, but you can't really perceive it. You know, Like there's clouds going overhead and the sun's kind of going up and going down. So the intensity of the ambient light, I should say, is uh, increasing or decreasing. So that means you'll have one fisheye that's kind of brighter than the next fisheye, which is a bit darker. So you don't know until you load it up and then you see, oh, there's a big like seam down the middle. So Stitch tries to fix that uh, automatically. You don't have to worry about it. It also applies auto adjustments to everything. So, um, and they're just a starting point. You know, if you like them, cool. You just don't have to adjust any of the image parameters at all, but um, they're not meant to be the, like the end all be all, like no software no Adobe Photoshop or Lightroom or anything, even you know, really fancy expensive software can automatically adjust images perfectly because it, it you know, they're just guessing, right? Based on complex um, voodoo math and algorithms. Stitch is exactly the same. It's just gonna guess and it's gonna try to make the images look, you know, relatively nice. Um, oh, okay, I see a question. Okay, I'll answer that. That's a good one. I'll get to that one in a second. All right, okay, so uh, before uh, I lose my spot here, um, I'm gonna talk about the basic interface of Stitch. Uh, this probably sounds very obvious, but there are icons at the top. Um, the icons that are there are really only what you need. You know, there's not a lot of extra weird stuff. Um, there's some things you might never use, but uh, it's nice to know what they are. So uh, top left-hand corner, um, you'll see I hope you can see, if I hover my mouse over, I get a little tooltip that says load project. All, all of the icons have that. So if you, if you mouse over and wait, it looks a little different on a Mac, but this is a Windows computer, um, but it'll tell you what it is. So if you um, forget <laughs> and you're like, what, what is this? You can always just hover your mouse over and wait and it'll tell you. Um, there's also help as well. So um, if you uh, click on the help um, button, it'll give you, you know, um, some hotkeys and a few other interesting tidbits of information. Uh, let me see here. There you go, that's better. Um, so let's just go through, through a few things real quick uh, in terms of the icons at the top. You've got the save button. So what that does is that saves any progress that you made. Now it auto saves it anyway. So let's suppose that you uh, spend 45 minutes aligning a bunch of data you know, when we'll get to that in a second, what that means, but you do that and then your computer crashes. If you load the data back in, it'll say, hey, you didn't save last time. Do you want to reload from your, your previous autosave? You just say like, yes. So, it, so it's always saving anyway. But if you click the save button after you've done something, you know that it's actually saved at that very moment. Um, there's no guesswork. Uh, the next button over is the one with the globe. That's probably the most important one here, really. Um, that uh, is the export button. So that's the last step. We'll get to that later. The next button over is the um, move and rotate button. And that's, um, you already saw me do it, I think. If you left click and drag or right click and drag, you can uh, move the data around on screen. Planix uh, does its best to auto align everything for you as you go. Um, IMS5 doesn't do that in the same way, uh, but either way you should have the ability to, um, you should hone the ability, there you go, to move data around so that when you get the data on screen like this, you can fix things that may have gone wrong during the shoot. So um, sometimes the auto alignment doesn't work for reasons. Um, sometimes um, you manually align something for fun, but then you realize you totally messed it up. <laughs> so um, Stitch gives you the ability to fix that later on. And that's awesome because that means that if you're pressed for time during a shoot, no big deal. It can be a little messy. It doesn't really matter. You can always fix it here. So, um, 
this may come up. It may not. I can see some questions in the, uh, um, in the Q and A. All right. Those are good questions. Okay. I'll totally get to those. Um, but there's one, something I wanted to say. So Mac users, I'm so sorry. Um, for this, but if you're using a Mac, um, you should probably go buy a mouse with three buttons on it. It'll make your life so much easier. No one wants to buy an extra thing, right? Especially with computer hardware being like ridiculously complicated and expensive right now, but having the left click drag, the right click drag, oh my gosh, trying to do this on a trackpad is the worst. You have to like, I forget what it is on Mac, you hold control and you click or something. Anyway, it's awful. You're better off just buying a, a mouse. So just FYI on that. Um, the, uh, next time at Conover is for adding notes. It's exactly what it sounds like. You can add notes anywhere you want on the floor plan. There you go. Typically those notes are going to be something like, please label this room, the atrium, you know, or something like that. Like that's almost always what they're for, but you can also include and exclude square footages. I'm not going to go into that. There's a whole knowledge base article on it. That's a separate thing, but, um, so the notes have their place. They're quite cool. Uh, and then the next button over on the, on the menu bar or the uh, icon bar is um, set the initial panel. So setting um, the initial panel angle means that's the first thing people will see when they click on the tour. So people navigate in different ways when they're looking at an eye guide. Sometimes they click on the dots on the visuals and they move forward. So when you move forward, you'll always be facing the same direction um, from the first panel to the second. But if you click on the floor plan, you know, there's no direction there. So it just chooses the default. And the default is the initial panel angle. And you can configure the initial panel angle for every single panorama on the tour in Stitch, or you can do it later um, on the portal. So if you don't do it here, it's not a big deal, but it's very convenient that you can. And if you look at the preview image here, um, you can see there's a blue box. So that blue box represents the first thing people will see when they click on that, that dot that represents the panel. And the first thing they see should be, it's a subjective, it can be whatever you want, but the first thing, in my opinion, should be um, something that identifies the space. So for example, this garage, I'm not gonna set the initial panel to be this artwork over here. That doesn't make any sense. I'm gonna set it to be the garage, the, you know, the vehicle and the, and the, the stuff so that people know what it is. Um, but at the end of the day, you can make it whatever you want. Occasionally, you will have a client say, hey, I, I clicked on the, the basement or, or some room and it starts in a weird spot. Can you fix that for me? And you can say, yeah, of course, no problem. And you can go into the portal and you can change it after the fact. So yeah, you can totally do that. Um, I'm gonna switch back to the move and rotate tool. And what you'll notice is when I was on, uh, when I had clicked this button, the set initial angle button, all of the following um, tools get grayed out. So there's a reason for that. You have to have the move and rotate button selected in order to get access to those. And those are all uh, related to moving data around. Um, the magic wand is an auto arrange function. So if you're using Planix, you probably won't really need this. If you're using um, IMS5, um, you might. So I'm not gonna go into any great detail except to say that when you click it, it's gonna go through every single scan one by one in the order that you shot them and try to align them for you. Um, there are two magnets, one magic and one less magical. Um, the magic magnet will just try to snap a, a panel. And I'll show you what that looks like. I'll drag it off to the side and then I'll click it. So that's pretty fast, but I'm, I'm sure you guys get the idea. It tries to match it to the rest of the data. And then the little magnet or the less magical magnet, sorry, um, is a fine adjustment. So when I click it, here, I'll click it with it, this data in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, see, it doesn't do anything. It needs to be near, very close to where it's supposed to be. And then it will align it um, to what's very, you know, it's like sort of um, local area. It'll, it'll try to align it to something that's close to it. And then you've got um, square up the floor button. So this button is used to align the whole floor. Let's see if it works. Oh yeah, it worked. So that's really just to square up the whole thing to the edges of the screen. Um, so I'm gonna show you some, some fun tricks that you may or may not know. If you hover your mouse cursor over the image and you use the scroll wheel on your mouse, you can like look up and down on the preview. <laughs> There's no scroll bar. I feel like there used to be one. So how would you know that's there, right? It's like a cool hidden feature. Um, so that's kind of neat. So this was clearly shot on a Planix. You can see it, <laughs> it's kind of neat. Um, 
another thing that I just did that I, I didn't explain, but I, it's kind of cool, is I pressed the letter F on my keyboard. And I hope you guys can see that all the data changes to green. So I can rotate the entire set of data at once. If I press F, F selects the whole floor. So how cool is that? Okay, moving on. We have a paint bucket. That's what it does. It shades things in. So if you have Planix, you'll know exactly what this is like because coverage is built in. Um, so it's exactly the same thing. After the fact, there's not much point in having this except as a really like a learning tool. So what this does is it, um, let me just turn it off real quick and show you. So here we have a pano center, right? And then we have all the data associated with it. When I've selected the pano, it will appear green and the data associated with that pano will also appear green. So you can see some of it's blue, some of it's green. So the selected pano is the one that's green. If I wanna see or get a better idea, because this is a bit messy, of what the laser was able to see and what it, what it hasn't been able to capture, I can click on that paint bucket and it will shade everything in, you know? And you can see there are lines, if I zoom in, you can see it really well. There are lines that go from the center to every point in the point cloud. And all that's for is just to show you what you captured and what you didn't capture. Um, and help you um, figure out what you need to do and what you don't need to do later on when you're shooting. So what people often do, especially when they first start, is they tend to overdo it a bit. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's a good strategy. <laughs> that's a very safe thing to do. Shoot way too much. You know, it takes you more time, but that's okay. You'll get, you'll get better as you go. Um, and you'll figure out what you need and what you don't. But, uh, you know, you shoot too much. And this tool allows you to figure out, okay, I shot five panos in the living room. Did I really need all those panos? You know? And so the answer for some of them is here in the data. You might say, well, the, the, what I'm seeing in the 360 from this view, you know, is very similar to this other view. Was there any data that was different? And that can allow you to say, okay, look, I didn't need to shoot that extra one. I could have just shot this, this one. I got all the measurement data and all the visuals that I needed. Anyway, that's all it does. It doesn't do anything other than change the way it looks, just like the coverage that you would see on Planix. Um, the little magnifying glass icon, zoom to fit. It just means that if your kids like sneak up on you and zoom in on the scroll wheel and you lose all your data, that's actually happened to me. You can click that button um, and it will put it back all on the screen at once. So it'll make it fit. Uh, and then the next one is the adjustment screen. So this is a big one. So this screen allows you to change the way the images look. Now um, there's actually a, point about this I think in the chat. These are JPEGs. So you can only push them so far. That's just the nature of JPEGs. So what that means is that although you have the ability to really go nuts, sometimes that doesn't really look good, you know? Um, so, you know, be careful when you're editing. That's, that's my just general advice is, uh, you know, try to make things look nice without pushing them into radioactive, crazy territory because you're working with JPEGs and you only have so much data to work with. Um, but you're going to see down here a bunch of sliders. And if you're familiar with any image editing software, you'll know exactly what these are for, for the most part. Um, shadows will brighten sort of the darker areas of the picture. Moving the highlight slider will darken the lighter areas. So it's very common to want to brighten up dark things and, and darken light things. Um, you've got brightness. That's exactly what it sounds like. Uh, you can add contrast, saturation, and clarity. Clarity is a funny one. Uh, it, you can't really see it on my screen, I'm sure, but it can cause some weird artifacts if you jack it up too high, so be careful. Now, the two that are a bit tricky, I wonder if I can find a good example for you, are blues and yellows. So those are meant to rescue you when you've got an issue. So let me see if I can find, uh, I feel like this one would be a good example. Maybe it's already been edited. Uh, not really. All right, I'll change the white balance artificially and I can show you what it does. So blues and yellows, um, those two sliders are meant to desaturate selectively the blues and then separately the yellows. So you might think, why would I want to do that? So this is a great trick for all real estate or any photographer ever. Um, so let's suppose that our photo looks more like this, okay? But that's how we want it. You know, the interior looks good, but then these windows are really blue. You know, this usually happens when there's a, a pretty big disparity between the outside and the inside light. So yeah, really warm inside light you know, tungsten bulbs or bulbs tuned to, you know, be like 3000 Kelvin or something. And then outside, you've got really, really cool or bluish um, exterior light from just like the sun. So sometimes what happens is the windows will look blue and you'll have these weird, weird blue um, sort of um, 
like uh, highlights on the floors. They look gross. So you can desaturate. So I hope you guys can see this, the blue channels only. This looks really weird and artificial at the moment because I'm not doing it particularly well, but you can see that that cleaned it up a bit. You know, that, that took a lot of the blue haze out. Um, so that's what that's for. And then the yellows is for the rare scenario. Um, you can see if I can find one, eh, this'll do for a demo, it's not great. Um, the rare scenario where you have a picture that is just so yellow um, that um, you can't be saved. So let's suppose you're in a basement, so there's no exterior light, the, the lights are tungsten, the walls are literally painted yellow um, and the camera just flips out. Like it doesn't know what it's doing. It can't figure, it's just like, it has no clue that this is, shouldn't be yellow or should be, it just goes wild. Um, so the colors won't look right. So what you can do is you can pull the yellows out just as you would. So I hope you guys can see that kind of in the lights here as I drop that slider down, it pulls the yellows out. So you can rescue a, a pano that's just way too warm using that. It's not perfect. It's gonna make the images look a little bit um, muted and sort of desaturated, but sometimes it's all you can do. Um, especially with really challenging lighting scenarios. Sometimes you're just doing the best you can with what you've got. Anyway, uh, there's a whole bunch of other stuff here. I'm not going to go into great detail about <clears throat> levels and gamma. You can mess around with it if you want. Um, they're very handy for, again, rescuing some images that are kind of messed up. So you've got some shadows that don't look right. You can get in there with the gamma and you can mess with it. Um, but just below it, there are presets. So everyone always asks this, like, oh, can we add presets? The answer is yes. You can add presets that you can apply to each panorama one by one. You know, manually you can choose, I want to apply a preset to this one and it will do it. Or you can apply presets to all of your um, uh, scans, like all in one go right on import. So you can set it up in the settings. I'll actually show you where that is right now. There you go. So I click, click the little icon with the wrench and the screwdriver. And you can see here, it says import. And then I can select one, two, or three. So I will tell you how to make those. So that means that if I, as soon as I import my property, it just applies the preset to every single panorama without me having to do anything. And there's a really good reason why it's set up that way. Often what you'll find is that the auto adjustments, like they're okay, but you always do the same thing over and over. You're like, I'm always adding plus 10 brightness to everything. Wouldn't it be better if this were automatic? And the answer is, yeah. It would be, <laughs> so so you can. Um, the uh, so, so the automatic presets are designed to be used um, for things like that across everything. And then sometimes you'll have presets that you kind of do like some of the time, you know, on every outdoor panorama, you're always boosting the saturation, for example, you know? So you think, oh, wouldn't it be cool if I could add this as a preset? You totally can, because you have three of them. The way you add presets is by adjusting the sliders on any panorama um to be what you want to add so for example let's suppose i want to add a 10 10 brightness to all my uh images okay so what i'm going to do is i'm going to zero everything out did that work no that totally didn't work yeah i have, I have weird ui issues with this uh that kind of looks like it's close we'll do that and then so you, you set it the way you want it as in what you want to add, not how you want the image to look. This is where people get into trouble. And then you click um, either copy if you want to send it to the clipboard or you choose a preset like set one and you click save. So I don't know if you guys can see this message up here, but it um, says it did it. So I'm going to go to the next panorama and then I'm going to click load and it just added 10, you know, plus 10 brightness. So it's a little bit weird, but that's how you do it. You set it up so that you, you, Take any panorama and you just set the slider so that it's what you want to add and then it will add that or subtract it depending on what you're doing on top of um, any subsequent panos that you load that preset to um, that sounded confusing as i was saying it so um, if you have questions there's i believe a whole knowledge base article on it uh, and then i think it's covered in the stitch videos as well in case i did a terrible job all right how are we doing for time oh 30 minutes okay so um fun fact over here on this folder tree, there are some clickable elements that are not immediately obvious. And some of them are like awesome. So first thing I wanna show you, so the, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't finish the icons. So after the adjustment hat, there's the take snapshots tool. If you click that, it loads up um, a preview of any given panorama. So if you wanna see, oops, 
Let's try that again. So if you want to see a full version of your 360, um, you can do it with this tool. Now, the point of this tool is so that you can snap still pictures from it. Um, so that's a whole separate topic, but yet yeah, you can absolutely 100% pull still images from any of these panoramas if you want. You can zoom in and out, you can change the aspect ratio, all sorts of wacky stuff. Um, the next button over is undo, and then there's settings, and then there's help. The yellow um, button is meant to provide you with hints um, in case something got messed up. So this is really more for IMS5 users and Planix. If you've adjusted the settings so that the white balance is really wacky, it'll tell you what you did wrong when you click it, which is quite cool. Okay, sorry, back to the folder tree. There's a bunch of really cool features here that are really neat. So if you click on the project name, you have a, uh, an area for comments. So you can write anything you want in here. So if you have a message, a general message you want to give to the draft people, or just tell them some funny jokes or a story or whatever, that's where you put it. Um, and that's attached to the data. So it's not like they can't miss it, if that makes any sense. You know what I mean? As soon as they load up the project, they're going to see it. So that's a really direct way to send a message. Um, if you click on the main building, you can uh, uh, change the wall thickness. So there's three places you can change the exterior wall thickness. When you're shooting, you can add it in. When you are in Stitch, you can change it. And then also later um, on the portal, you can change it. You have lots of opportunities if you forget it or if you want to change it or whatever. So that's kind of cool. If you click on the floor, you're going to get that thing I mentioned earlier where you select a grade. So in case you guys don't know, above grade means above the ground and below grade means usually underground. But that's a very oversimplified way of um, explaining it because every area is a little different in how they report what is below ground. So it's not as simple as I'm making it sound. So I'll give you an example. You've got a basement walkout. I mean, if you're in Florida or California, you don't have basements. You can just completely ignore everything I'm saying and take a nap. But basically um, you've got a basement walkout and half of it's below the earth and half of it's above. So is it below grade? In some areas it is, in some areas it's not. So unfortunately, it's on you to figure out in your area how your clients are reporting that and then um, label it accordingly. Now, if you label it wrong here, it's not a big deal. You can always go change it on the portal. Um, and you can also um, choose to include below grade in the totals, even if it's labeled below grade. So it's not as though you need to fudge it um, in certain areas. So some areas will include below grade regardless of how it's, um, you know, uh, interpreted. So that's kind of cool. Um, you can click on each individual panorama in this list and you're going to be able to see a preview. So fun pro tip. It's a good idea whenever you shoot a property and you load it into stitch to just go through every single pano one by one and make a note of any weird ones. So what I mean by that is that, um, if you give the, the whole project a real quick sweep, you're going to see, oh, look, there's a camera and a mirror. I need to edit that out. Oh, look, there's the agent. Um, I can see his elbow sticking around a doorway or, oh my gosh, there's my keys on a table. You know, you'll just notice stuff when you're fresh. If you go in and you start messing around with each image one by one, by the time you get to pano 30, you might just be a little bit tired. You might just miss stuff. So doing one full sweep is often really handy for noticing things like things that are out of place, things you might need to edit, um, images that are inconsistent. So what I mean by that is you might have a really consistent white balance throughout like the first 20 panos. And then the, for some reason, the 21st one's just weird. Like it just went really blue for some reason. So in that context of the rest of the panos, you'll notice that really easily, but going one by one by one, you might not. Um, so that's really handy um, thing to do. And you just use the arrow keys on your keyboard. You just press down and it'll just go through them all. It's kind of cool. Um, the uh, floors, um, over here are exactly what they look like. They're like nested folders. So each floor will have its own, you know, entry and you can change the above and below grade for each one. Fun fact, if you right click on this stuff, you get more options. So if you right click on the project, you can add a building, for example, you can, um, re-import it. So if you want to reload the whole project up, you can, and then clean up just deletes a bunch of files that aren't necessary for storage. It can be um, generated by the software. So if you want to save space, you can hit clean up and it'll wipe them all out. It doesn't delete anything permanently that you need. It just deletes stuff that gets created by Stitch that can be recreated at any time. So it's very safe. If you right click on the building, 
you can add another floor. So let's suppose you go to a property and there are two buildings <clears throat> on the property. You're thinking to yourself, what am I going to do here? So you make one, you just make them all floors. You know, you make main floor, second floor for the first building, main floor, second floor for the second building. You can come in here and you can right click and add a building and then click and drag the floors from one building to another. So I'll show you what that looks like. That's another fun, cool secret effect. So if I add a building, I can name it. Name. There you go. Um, cool place. There you go. So now what I can do is I can take this basement and I can click and drag it over here. Let's move this up. Make it easier to see. There you go. So now my, my basement floor is on a separate building. And this separate building will have its own wall thickness and its own floors and everything. On the reports, it'll have its own floor plans and a separate summary and the whole nine yards. Um, also fun fact, you can click and drag panos from one floor to another and from one building to another. So let's suppose you shoot a whole project and at the very end, you realize, whoops, I totally forgot to shoot some random thing like the cold cellar, I don't know. And you go and you shoot it and then you realize you put it on the second floor, but it's supposed to be in the basement. Don't, don't reshoot it, don't even worry about it. You can always just click and drag it in Stitch from wherever you had it to the, to the basement. You can click and drag it over, it's fine. Um, and that's really handy to know uh, because that um, is a weird one. Uh, let's see here. So the folder tree has um, for each panorama, another hidden menu. If you right click on the pano, you get all these options here. And these options are, um, well, pretty awesome. So the probably the most important one is hide and eye guide. Um, hide and eye guide means that it will be hidden when the tour is um, viewed you know, publicly. When people click on the link and they look at the eye guide, they're not gonna see this. Doesn't delete the data in any way. So that's really important to know. So if you um, are caught in like an embarrassing position in like one of the mirrors, like scratching yourself or something and you hide it, the draft people will all still see it. Just FYI, I warned you, so now that's on you. Um, but hiding means that you can always show it later. So let's suppose you've got a room like a laundry room and it's not like messy, but it's also not that nice. And you think, well, I don't know if I really want my agent will like this. So you can do is you can hide it and then you can have that conversation later. You can say, hey, like, do you, do you want me to turn on? I, I turned off the laundry room. It was kind of ugly, but then I thought maybe you'd want it. And sometimes they're like, yeah, yeah, turn it on. It's okay. We don't care. <laughs> We'd rather have people see it than ask questions. Um, but there are sort of two conversations that you'll have. So I, 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 I like hiding a lot more than I show. Usually with the tour, I like to have less rather than more. Um, because there are, there are two types of conversations. The first one is, is, is the good one where you have someone call you and they say, Hey, I, I was looking at the tour. It's really great, but I noticed I can't see the laundry room. What's, what's up with that? And you say, well, you know, it didn't look that nice. I thought I'd just leave it off. Um, if you want me to turn it on, I can do it at any time. And they say, Oh, you know what? Don't worry about it. You're right. It was pretty dumpy. And then there's the other type of conversation, the much, much worse one where an agent calls you freaking out or someone calls you freaking out and they're like the homeowner looked at the tour and they saw their underwear in the laundry room in a basket and they're losing their minds and I've now lost them as a client and you know, that kind of stuff. So I hate those conversations. So I prefer to turn more off than, uh, than maybe the average person, perhaps I'm a bit cautious. Um, but anyway, that's what that does. You can hide or show things at any time um, here. You can control that, but you can also do it later in the portal. So if you hide something and then you change your mind, you're like, no, I, we really should show that. No big deal. You can always turn it on later. Um, the next thing on this list though, open folder, this is the one, uh, that I was referencing the, the option I was referencing earlier about Photoshop. So if I click open folder, what happens is I'm on a windows PC. So it shows me the folder on my windows PC. And this is the actual data that was captured during the shoot. So what I've got is I've got an H1 JPEG and that's the full equi rectangular, um, sorry, let's try that again. Equi rectangular. There you go one by two, 360 uh, image in JPEG format. Uh, and then I've got some other data files. And then I also have an S JPEG. So everyone always asks, what's the S one for? So when you're shooting with your camera system, it doesn't make sense to send like an eight megabyte um, or nine and a half megabyte image to like your phone or your tablet, that would take forever. So what they do is they downsample it real quick and then they send that to your phone or tablet as a preview. So that's just there as it's just a preview that you were using when you were shooting. So you can just totally ignore it. But if you want to bring this JPEG into Photoshop or Lightroom, go right ahead. You totally can do that. 
Um, you can do selective tonal adjustments. You can adjust white balance. You can do global adjustments on the whole image if you want. You can do anything you like. Uh, the only thing that you need to do is save uh, that JPEG in Photoshop or Lightroom and overwrite the original because there's a trick. If you make a change, you have to go back to the Stitch software and you have to update it because it loaded this preview and it doesn't know you've made a change yet. So you have to right click and you have to choose reload. So that's the next option. And when you choose reload, what happens is it, it says, okay, so we'll reload this and it reloads the image, but it uses the one that you had edited. And then, so you'll see your changes, you know, click in and take place. Um, the next thing on our list is re-import. That just re-imports um, the images and reprocesses the stitching. Delete is exactly what it sounds like. It deletes it. So, so an another warning, if you delete a panorama, it is deleted from your computer. There is no trash bin. There is no, um, there's no undo. When you delete it, it is gone. So, so you, you hide stuff you want to keep and you delete stuff that you don't. And when you delete it, it is, no one will ever see it. It is gone. So if there's anything incriminating in the tour, you delete it. Um, reverse camera rotation, that's for uh, IMS5. Um, and the last option on here, set initial pano, is um, uh, a way of setting the very first thing that people see when they load the tour. So this is impossible to see on my screen, I apologize, but there is a little orange dot that appears when you set a pano as the initial pano. So setting the initial pano means that when someone loads up the tour, that's the first pano that they see. It's the same thing with everything else I've said. You can always update it to something different later, um, but it's good to think about it in terms of um, you know, making a change later uh, if you didn't shoot um, in ideal conditions. Oh, there's lots of chat in the chat. Let me have a look here real quick. I had all my closet shots. Yep, for sure. Uh, typically you would hide things that like, and so hiding does not remove the scan data. It just hides it. You can always enable it later. But uh, you hide stuff like ugly things, like you know closets and cupboards and weird things that where you're just shooting it really for measurement. You don't want you know, anyone like publicly to see that. Um, okay, I'll come back to the questions in a minute. I can see a lot of stuff there. Okay. So uh, did we get everything? Oh, set initial panel, right. So the order that you shoot in is the order that the panoramas will play um, when you press the auto play button on the tour. So it does matter, this, this order from top to bottom. So like nine times out of 10, when you're shooting a property, you just go in like whatever order makes sense, right? Like you shoot the foyer and then you walk the hallway, you shoot there and you go to the living room. Like you shoot it in the order that you walk through it because that's the easiest way to do it. But one of the huge benefits of the iGUIDE camera system is that you can do whatever you want. It's non-linear. So if you want to shoot it in a really wacky order where you're just kind of all over the place, um, that's not ideal. That's more work for you. But sometimes that's what you got to do because you're working around other people or obstacles or who knows what. So if that's the case and you've shot it in a weird order, you can still set the initial pano, but the order that they play in the autoplay will still be messed up. So um, and the order that they appear if you switch floors will still be, still could be different than what you want. So fun fact, you can click and drag panoramas up and down in the list. So you can see, I just moved panorama three so that it's now between pano 11 and 12. Um, that doesn't make any sense in this scenario, but if that had been shot after the fact, like, so if I'd shot um, the whole property and then I'd left one spot, cause I was like, well, you know, they're hanging a mirror or they're doing something in there. I can go back and shoot it. And then when I'm in stitch, I can click and drag it so that it appears next to um, the other panoramas that it's um, close to in the property. That way, if you press the autoplay button and you know, you're listening to that chill music and you're watching them auto pan from left to right or whatever, uh, they'll go in a logical sequence that makes sense. Um, so that's about it for the folder tree. Uh, Let's talk about the data. So I already kind of showed you guys some cool stuff. How much time we have? All right, I'll talk for five more minutes. I'll do questions. Um, you can see if you zoom in, there are compasses. That's on purpose. Every time you shoot a scan, um, there are uh, compass readings that are taken. All those readings are averaged out. Uh, and then a compass is applied to the final floor plan. But it's kind of cool. You can actually see them. And you can see how some of them line up and some of them don't. That's pretty normal. The compasses aren't super accurate. That's why you have to average them all. Um, but they're kind of a cool guide. Like you can kind of tell if a pano is like really out of whack. Um, so this one, for example, really should be more like this. That's the garage, I think. Yes, yeah, so that doesn't even go there. Um, so I'm using a special trick 
that you guys probably can't see. I'm using the space uh, bar on my keyboard. And if I tap it, it will select the nearest panel um, in the data. And this is a really killer feature because you can just find something you want to move, tap the space bar, and then put it by left clicking and dragging it wherever you like. OK. Uh, the goal with Stitch. What is the overall goal? Let's, let's, let's wrap it up. So the whole point of Stitch is to take the data and to configure it so that it's um, ready for drafting. You know, so all the data is all lined up. I and mean, hopefully PlanX has done it for you, but if it's not, you can fiddle with it. Um, and to turn panoramas on and off so that um, you know, everything's all ready to go, can be published, uh, and to add anything like room labels that you need to, and to adjust the images so that they, they look nice. You know? <laughs> um, the uh, final step though, the, you know, the important thing is to click the export button and then take that data and send it in. So this is probably super obvious to all of you, but I'm just going to say it. Stitch doesn't send anything to anybody. It's like, it's like a Photoshop piece of software. It lives locally on your computer. It doesn't, it doesn't auto send anything. So what that means is if you click export and then five minutes later, you realize, whoops, I totally forgot the basement. No big deal. You can just go back make the, uh, the updates that you want, changes to anything you like, and then click export again. You can do it as many times as you like. So until you send that data in, no one will see it. Um, so that's quite cool, especially if it's like 2 a.m. and you're editing photos and you're very tired and you make a lot of mistakes. All righty. Um, did I miss anything? Uh, Hotkeys. Okay, so there's workflow. I forgot about that. Let's do shortcuts. Is there anything cool in here? Oh yeah, you can select... Um, some scans versus all. I don't usually use that. Oh yeah, that's pretty cool. So you can select a bunch of scans, um, but not all of the scans, and then you can move and rotate them as a group. That's actually really handy. So if you shoot a giant um, mega warehouse, for example, and you shoot like the first area, and then you go somewhere else and you shoot the second area, you can just select them in a big group and then merge them together rather than move one at a time. Um, that can be kind of a pain. Uh, Settings, we talked about that. There's a sharpness slider in here. My honest advice is don't touch it. Just leave it, it's fine. Yeah, overdoing the sharpness always makes things look terrible. <laughs> um, all right, we're running out of time. I'll, I'll do the, the questions now. How are we doing here? Okay, I can hear you, yay. Oh, that was me. All right, yeah, here's the one I saw. Okay, it is imperative that the HDR process is made better. Editing JPEGs in post doesn't cut it. All the info is gone. Editing makes it look worse. A guy needs to dump a DNG and the edits need to be done at file instead of JPEG. Yeah, I totally agree with you. But um, I'll tell you why it's not that way now. So one of the things with the DNG is that in order to use that, um, I mean, I don't know if you, I'm, I'm assuming if you're talking about, you know what, I, what it looks like, but it's basically the two fisheye images. So um, yes, there is more dynamic range there. And yeah, you get way more wiggle room with regards to white balance, which is like a godsend. But um, when that's taken and it's um, stored, it's significantly uh, larger amount of data, you know? So that's obstacle number one, it's way more data. Um, it's not a problem really with storage because storage is cheap. It's really more about speed, about writing that data to the drive. So that's, that's the first thing, it's slower. Um, that's probably not that big a deal to overcome, but it's something to note. And then what happens is that you'd be then offloading that, that post-processing back into Stitch. So um, I'm not gonna throw Rico under the bus. They have a stitching application, but it is not fabulous. I'll say that, there you go. There are some rumors that they're gonna make a standalone stitching application. I don't know if that's true or not. I certainly hope it is because the Lightroom Classic plugin is just awful. It is so awful. And the worst part is that on their website, they say, uh, what is it? They phrase it as um, you can use it for Adobe Photoshop Lightroom Classic. So it kind of gives you this idea. You can load it up in Photoshop and I haven't been able to figure out how to do it. So if you guys know, let me know. Um, and I'd be happy to figure that out. But anyway, the process of doing that is just more complicated. So you're totally right. There is more data there, but the, um, the, the obstacle is, is really the software and it's not really us. It's really about um, the software from Rico and making that stitching process available outside of the camera. Oh, again, that's more time. So in kind of funny, you, you'd actually be saving a bit of time because you're not stitching it on camera when you're shooting, but if it's like a fraction of a second, it doesn't take that long to stitch. So um, you'd be offloading that later onto your computer. So that means more editing time. So that might for some people be a problem. Um, 
but then you've got the issue. So what I, you didn't say it specifically, but a lot of people have asked for, um, you know, configurable bra brackets. So I want to be able to do like nine shots. Um, and uh, I want to be able to, you know, get really just absolutely crisp and perfect window pulls. Um, and that's cool. Um, I totally support that. Um, that means a lot more time is going to be spent not only shooting, but also in post-processing, but some projects are worth it. So to your point, yes, that is a good idea. Um, but further development will have to take place in order for something like that to, um, uh, to be implemented. Um, there are many challenges and we are aware and I say working on them. I'm not working on them. I'm not a software developer, but I'm sure someone is. Uh, when I shoot front back one, two mode, I find the white balance on both images looks different every time. Any tricks to fix that? Yeah, so uh, cool thing is that um, auto equalization it's either already there or it's being added. It's being added to fix that automatically for you. So, yep. Um, and it works awesome for IMS5. It's amazing because you'll have three separate images and it equalizes all three um, using different white balances while shooting is like a totally a no big deal. Just ordered this mouse. It's good. Good stuff. It'll make your life better. It makes it easier. Um, the viewer really needs WASD. I know, right? My kids and I, we all play Fortnite WASD and you just get so used to that being the method by which you move around that the fact that it's not in the viewer. So I'm going to agree with you on that one. Um, that is on the roadmap. I don't know where, um, if you guys have questions about, you know, when things are going to occur, don't ask me, I don't know anything, but um, you can always create a support ticket, straight up ask if you haven't already, or you know what, I'll also put it in the forum. Actually, you know what, I'll say this. So. Anytime you have a feature suggestion, it's always a good idea to go put it in the feature suggestions area of the forum. We read the forum. So, I mean, we will know it's there. In all likelihood, it's already on our roadmap, you know, because we think about this stuff all the time. Um, but when you go put it on the forum, the iGuide forum, in case you're not familiar, um, forum.goiguide.com, uh, you put it there, all of a sudden you'll have other people say, yes, that is a good idea. I've been waiting for that for a while. Or, yeah, I didn't thought of that, but we really need that in my area or whatever. And one voice becomes many, and then all of a sudden, our priorities change and we push it up the list. So that's my hot take is go on the forum and put it in the feature suggestions area, and then everyone have a big discussion about it. Is the billing linked to just above grid? No. So this is always super confusing. So sometimes you're talking about properties, right? And you're using different numbers to describe them. So I say, this house is 2,500 square feet, and you say, wait, no, it's not. This house is 3,500 square feet. And so what I'm referring to is above grade and what you're referring to is below grade. So don't think about above and below grade when you're thinking about billing. Uh, there is something called billable area. So it's um, available on the portal. You can go into each property. I can't off the top of my head exactly remember where it is, but if you search for billable area on, on the knowledge base articles and the support desk, it'll come up. It's in there somewhere. It's like in paid add-ons or something. Um, just hunt around, you'll find it. Uh, but it'll show you the exact amount of square footage that was drawn. So that's what you're, you're paying for. You're paying for um, the total square footage that someone had to physically draw and then convert into floor plans and then uh, put online for you. So billable area. Uh, for Mac users, what do you do in place of a right click? I hope someone answered that. I think it's control click. That's a guess. You could Google it too. Uh, does hiding remove scan data? Nope. No, it just hides it. Oh, you already answered. Cool. Um, all right, I answered that one too. I hide all my open closets. Okay. I went to export report yesterday and got an error and it was close to 50 centimeters. I knew that it was close to 50 centimeters, something like that. I hit ignore and sent off anyway and got it. What does it mean? Oh, good question. Okay, that's actually a really good question. So I sort of skipped over some stuff in, um, it, in the export process because we kind of ran out of time. But when you click the export button, you're going to get a whole bunch of information. And this information is uh, there to um, like protect you. It's not meant to stop you. Um, so when, so I'll explain the specific error that you got. If you have two scans that are too close together, what happens is that um, on the iGuide tour, we can only show one of them. We can't have two dots like on top of each other. You wouldn't be able to click, like which one would you click on? One of them has to be on top. So what that means, a choice has to be made. Which one are we going to show and which one are we going to hide? So the meaning of that message, um, maybe it should be written more clearly, is that if you don't choose one to disable or hide, we'll have to do it for you. So you're in a, a dining room, okay? And you have shot the dining room 
And then you realize that there is a cat sitting on the dining room table. So you go over, you pet the cat and you shush it away and it runs off. And then you shoot the scan again for the dining room. So now you've got two identical scans. So when a, so if you don't disable the one with the cat, we might not know which one it is that you want or you don't want. So you could get into trouble by having the cat accidentally on that table. So the drafts person might look at it and say, well, okay, these look really similar. They don't see the cat and they turn off the one without it. Um, so what that message is really telling you is that you need to choose which scan is visible because two of them or maybe more are too close together. That's all that means. There's a bunch of other errors that you can get. There can be compass problems. It's very common in condos with like really thick uh, concrete um, where you can't get a compass reading. Um, again, you can just ignore them. It's not a big deal. Um, there's a few other ones as well. The biggest, uh, the most problematic ones are the ones that you can't ignore. So it depends on how you have it configured. Let's see if it's still in here. Uh, yeah, so on export right now, mine is um, configured, my stitch is configured to force me to select the initial pano and angle. So if I don't select the initial panorama, it won't let me export. The ignore button won't be there. Um, and similar to that, if I don't choose, say hi. hi. <laughs> you can't play Fortnite right now. I'm still doing my webinars. That sucks. Yeah, like 15 minutes. Okay, sorry about that. Um, work from home, right? It's good. They're cool about it. I've taken over like the whole basement, so I feel kind of bad. <laughs> so um, the... Uh, the only other thing that'll stop you from having that ignore button is the above or below grade selector. And that um, just means you have to go to each floor and select above or below grade. Okay, drone photos need a special tag when added to a tour. I see other floor scans all over the horizon. I agree, that one, that's really weird. You go to an aerial panorama and then the indoor ones are like way too close and like humongous and look really strange. That's feature suggestions all the way. Um, uh, where is, I see. Oh, no, that's right. Uh, oh, it makes sense. I did multiples as I wanted to show the depth of closet. Yes. So it's very common to stack panoramas for that specific reason. So you're dead on. You shoot one in the hallway and then you realize, oh, there's a closet over here. And then you go open it and then you shoot another one to kind of measure in the closet and show the drafts people in the closet there. And then all of a sudden you've got two on top of each other. So you need to pick the one that's like attractive for the tour. So typically that's the one without the closet door open. And then you hide the other one. And if you don't hide it, it's going to give you that warning. And then if you don't do it, we'll try to do it. We'll just guess, but I mean, the drafts people will rather. Okay, five questions in the actual Q&A section. I'm going to hop over there. I've got two minutes left. Can you export one or more photos from Stitch to Photoshop? So you can bring um, any of these panoramas into Photoshop one by one, but there's no way to do it in a batch way. That's kind of a thing that we're looking into. But um, it, typically what you would do um, when you're bringing things into Photoshop is you're going to have, you're going to have a reason. And the reasons are usually something like, there's something you want to edit out of the photo. There's something that you want to um, change. Like, so like there, you know, edit out of the photo, like a person or a camera or mirror reflection or whatever. There's something that you want to change in terms of color, or there's something you want to change, well, for whatever reason, brightness or something. And they're almost always like one-offs, almost, not always. Um, so typically what you do is you'll right click on the pano, you'll choose open folder, you'll open the H1 in Photoshop, edit it, click save. It's going to say, do you want to overwrite? You say yes. You go back to stitch and you click reload and boom, you're done. And that process sounded kind of complicated when I was saying it, but honestly, it's like a minute and a half. Like you can be in and out so fast. It's crazy. Lightroom's a little trickier because you have to pull it in and then export it and then overwrite it. But I'm not a Lightroom expert, so that's up to you guys. Uh, also found out you cannot download Stitch on Chromebook. Yes, so you can't use it on a Chromebook. Mac or PC only, um, which totally sucks. I agree with you. Uh, my son has a Chromebook. It's kind of awesome. It has a touch screen. I was very impressed. Fingerprint scanner. I'm like, what is this? Uh, are there any rules about naming an eye guide? Uh, no. There might be some in the terms of service about like including swear words, but um, no one's ever asked that before. Uh, no, um, you know, so I, I'm guessing what you mean by naming an eye guide is what appears on the title. So you can configure what an eye guide is called um, to be, well, anything you want, essentially. So it's very common. I mean, 99% of the time, it's the property address. So, you know, that's the default. But if you want to change it, if you click the blue edit button on the iGuide portal, like one of the first things there is title. And sometimes you, you might, maybe you do an iGuide for a builder and you want to change it to Harmony Homes Model Home. Okay, cool, go ahead. Um, you can change that at any time you want. Um, 
and it will change the title on the eye guide tour, the title on the floor plans, and the title anywhere it would appear essentially. So that's kind of cool. Um, how do I enter unfinished area reporting? Is it done in Stitch? Yeah, I don't have time to explain it, uh, but you can put the word unfinished on there, but go to the knowledge base and search for um, exclude area, include area or unfinished area. And what it will do is it will, you'll load up an article and it'll have everything in it um, with little pictures that show where you can put the things on it. You can label different areas to be whatever you want. And the drafts people will then um, select the type for that space. Okay. Uh, last question. Is the one half shooting done 180 plus 180? Yeah. Um, so the way it works is that you stand on one side uh, and it's shooting, it's shooting, well, it's essentially shooting with both lenses. So it's kind of funny. It just throws one away, but it shoots one half and then it, you walk around the other side, it shoots the other half. And then on camera, it's going to merge them together. That's why you can have differences in white balance it can mess things up because it's taking two separate captures of both lenses and then kind of throwing out the left one and then throwing out the right one and merging them and stitching it. Um, that was a very confusing answer, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, I was reading about using iGuide logo in my advertising, but was confused on how it could be used. Can you please clarify? Absolutely. So using the iGuide logo, think of it like Coca-Cola. We're not that big, but that's okay. If you are selling a thing like an iGuide, well, then you're certainly more than welcome to use the logo to sell the product, which is an iGuide. You know, I'm selling an iGuide tour. You know, iGuide doesn't have an enormous amount of brand recognition, but it's got some different areas have different market share. So it's going to sort of depend, but that iGuide logo, if you were to use it on your website, you would use it in like, for example, your pricing section. I'll give you an example. You have a, a package, you know, you're offering still photos, I don't know, a drone video and an iGuide. So that's where you slap an iGuide logo, right? Where you don't use an iGuide logo is to um, in, in like your company name or in your URL or anywhere it could be confused to make it seem like you like work for iGuide, you know? So you don't want people to think that you own the company. You want them to know that you sell iGuides, you know, that you offer that as a service or a tour. Um, there is a whole bunch of brand guidelines in a booklet that you can download uh, from the website, I'm guessing. Let's have a look. There we go. Uh, so we've got a resources marketing catalog. So actually, if you have any marketing questions in terms of um, assets, you know, you like brochures or logos or whatever, go to resources, go to the marketing catalog, and then my chat is in the way. There you go. I got branding guide. So that should, in theory, answer all your questions. It's supposed to describe how the logo can be used and where it can be used and all that kind of stuff. Okay, done. There's no more questions in the chat. We're finished. Okay. Uh, best webinar ever. Thank you so much, everybody. That was awesome. Um, I think I'm doing another one next week. So um, I don't know what it's on, but it's probably going to be amazing. Um, please, please go subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's my, my one ask. <laughs> um, and uh, I'd mentioned it a few times today, but the knowledge base is an excellent place to go hunt around for answers. So our support teams work really, really hard to get you answers to your questions when you send in support tickets and emails, but um, sometimes it's like 2 a.m. and they're clearly not working, right? So especially if you're in a time zone or you're on a, another continent, if you're in Norway, for example, um, they might not be keeping the same hours. So if you don't want to wait, go to the knowledge base, look around um, like 99.9% .9 of the time, there will be some sort of article uh, there um, that will um, have what you want. Hey, have a great day, everybody. Thank you uh, so much.